John Holdren, it's safe to say, gets a reaction no matter who is listening. He is now the special advisor on science and technology to President Obama, also the director of the White House Office on Science and Technology Policy. Dr. Holdren, really a pleasure to have you with us today. Happy to be here. Is that a fair assessment? You get a reaction wherever you go? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope they're mostly good reactions. Uh, you and I were talking just a moment ago, Doctor, about the convergence of your belief regarding climate and environment and what the administration believes as well. And it seems to some degree like a perfect marriage. I think it is. Uh, when I talked to uh, President-elect Obama <laughs> last December uh, about this job, it became apparent uh, that we were very much on the same page uh, on issues of energy and climate as well as on issues of innovation more broadly, the role that science, technology and innovation have to play in addressing the big challenges we face, not just energy and climate, but economic recovery and growth, creation of sustainable jobs, reducing dependence on foreign oil, addressing the big problems we have in our healthcare system by using science and technology to get better outcomes at lower costs. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the science and technology issues around space, around information technology, around infrastructure, uh, and of course, something that's a, a, a tremendous priority for the president which is education, and particularly science, technology, engineering, and math education. Mm -hmm. So we get the next generation of scientists and technologists we're going to need to work on these problems. And so we raise the whole level of public understanding of science and technology so people can be more effective participants in a democracy where science and technology are parts of so many of the, of the big policy choices mm -hmm. we face. You have been involved in climate issues and preservation issues for decades now. Uh, Secretary Chu, during his speech here at the summit just moments ago, mentioned the administration goal of an 80% emissions reduction cut by 2050. Uh, is that the right set of numbers in your mind? Uh, absolutely, I think that's the right ballpark. If you look at the pace with which climate change is happening and the rate at which adverse impacts, uh, which we're already experiencing, are accelerating, and you look at the numbers as to what the world needs to do in order to stabilize the climate in a condition that we can manage and live with, you really come to the conclusion that the world needs to be something in the range of 50% below current emissions by 2050. And the industrialized countries clearly have to lead. We have to leave a bit of room for countries like India and China, Brazil and Mexico to do some more growing before their emissions curves also have to bend over and start to decline. And if you do that arithmetic, 80% below in 2050 is about the right place uh, for the United States to be. And that has been President Obama's uh, position since the campaign. Uh, when you talk about the international community, Dr. Holdren, and, and, and a potential successor to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, will the driving force come from your community, the science community, rather than the political community? Uh, world leaders are very good at disagreeing over small issues, yet scientists, it seems, are more predisposed to finding common ground. Well, I would say we're actually uh, beyond the point already where it's just the science community uh, we're relying on. Uh, you might have said that 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. But the situation is different now in a very interesting way. Now you see many of the largest, most influential corporations on the planet mm -hmm. saying, we've got to address the climate change challenge. You see uh, all kinds of interesting coalitions, uh, religious groups, uh, the military seeing climate as a security threat. Uh, people of faith saying, look, we have to protect the climate as part of stewardship of the creation. Uh, you're seeing uh, among political leaders all around the world uh, an acceptance of the fundamental challenge we face, that we have to stabilize the climate because the consequences of not doing it uh, will be really unmanageable. I mean, you talk these days to Chinese leaders, Indian leaders, European leaders, Japanese leaders, American leaders, it doesn't matter. The overwhelming majority understand that climate change is real, mm -hmm. it's accelerating, it's dangerous, we have to fix it. And so it's not any longer a matter of just saying, well, well, we got scientists who care about this, but nobody else does. Uh, doctor, final question for you. That is the implementation, the physical action of reducing emissions. And that certainly comes down to science and technology. What is the driving force behind that? Is it policy or is it public funding? Or maybe the answer is they go hand in hand. Well, I think it's a combination. In order to get the amount of action we need, we need to do a number of things. We, most importantly, have to put a price on the emissions of greenhouse gases. We have to make it expensive to emit these gases so there is an economic incentive not to, 
and an economic incentive to innovate to find the most cost-effective ways to reduce those emissions. That's why it's so important that we get out of the Senate a climate change bill which has in it the cap-and-trade approach which has the effect of putting a price on carbon pollution and providing the incentives to reduce it. That's the single most important thing we need to do. But we also need to increase our investments in energy research development and demonstration in order to bring down the costs of the clean energy technologies that we're going to deploy in order to solve this problem. And we need, again, to make the research and experimentation tax credit permanent so that we further incentivize the private sector to do the research and the development and the innovation mm -hmm. that needs to come from them ultimately if these technologies are going to find their way into the marketplace and have the big impact that we need. And in your opinion, funding for the latter comes from the former? That is the price on carbon? A lot of the funding will come from a price on carbon. And the President has committed himself to $150 billion over 10 years, $15 billion a year in investments in clean energy technology to catalyze what needs to be done. Ultimately, what the private sector invests will be far more than that. Mm -hmm. But what people need to understand is that this is not money down a black hole. This is money that's going to create jobs, it's going to create uh, new industries, new businesses. Uh, there are many folks who think, and I'm one of them, that clean energy is going to be the great driver of economic growth uh, and recovery uh, in the decades ahead. And it's safe to say the president agrees with you and on the, that. And the, the president <laughs> is absolutely in agreement on that. Right. An influential voice on science and technology with the White House, Dr. John Holdren, pleasure to have you with us, Thank sir. you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.